I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal, and I'm here today with Adam Friedman, who's come by to talk about his new book, The Naked Constitution, What the Founders Said and Why It Still Matters. It's a wonderful book about what role the judiciary is, is playing in American life and what role it should play. Uh, it's accessible. Adam, welcome. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be on. Let me start by getting you to explain what you mean by the naked Constitution and by the other term that you use throughout the book, the living Constitution, as its contrast. Well, let me start with the living Constitution because that is what a generation of lawyers have been indoctrinated to believe in. The living Constitution is a theory that the Constitution's meaning can literally change over time without formal amendment. And so the Constitution uh, can stand for all kinds of policy uh, preferences that just happen to match those of whoever's in power at the time. The problem is that we've never had a metaphor to combat the living Constitution. The living Constitution has a kind of uh, nice, warm, and fuzzy feel about it. We don't want a dead Constitution, which would be the logical opposite of it. But what we really want is a naked Constitution in the sense that we want to get back to the text, stripped of what uh, the late Raoul Berger called all of the judicial encrustations that have been added to it. Your book argues that the living Constitution is destructive of the system of limited government that the founders uh, established. Yet the idea of the living Constitution goes back at least to Woodrow Wilson a hundred years ago. And if I'm reading your book correctly, to John Marshall back in the 1820s in a case he decided on the Commerce Clause. How do you respond to critics who say the Constitution has always been alive? It goes back to the founding era as a living Constitution. I think my first response to the critics would be not that we've had a living Constitution since the founding, but that the temptation to read things into the Constitution has always been present because it is our supreme law. It is true that I think the Marshall Court could fairly be criticized for twisting the Constitution to achieve ends that happen to be favorable to the Federalists. Of course, John Marshall was a staunch Federalist. But it was only until you got to the Progressive Era that the idea of um, playing fast and loose with the Constitution's text was elevated into a virtue. Uh, before it was always cloaked in the idea that, that the judges were really following the true meaning of the Constitution. Wilson and his allies did away with that by creating a dichotomy. The Constitution, they said, Wilson in particular said that uh, the Constitution was an 18th century Newtonian type of document. It was outdated. We now lived in a Darwinian age. And so what the Constitution needs to do is what Darwin taught us. It needs to evolve. It needs to be organic. And so that was the way they dressed up this idea of um, judges and politicians usurping power that rightfully uh, belongs to the states and the people. What have been the most uh, egregious examples, in your view, of judicial overreach in American history? The most egregious? Well, Brian, so, so, so little time, so many cases to, uh, to discuss. But let me start right at the beginning. Certainly, John Marshall, as you mentioned, in uh, McCullough v. Maryland and also in Gibbons v. Ogden, which I think is the case you were referring to before, gave us an interpretation of the federal government's powers that set the stage for later courts to um, essentially take away the limitations that were inherent in Article I's enumeration of powers. And the, the height or the depth of that tendency, I think, came in the famous Wickard versus Filburn, where the Supreme Court upheld the power of the federal government, which at one time had been a government of limited enumerated powers, the power of the federal government to regulate what an individual farmer could grow on his own land for his own family's consumption. But judicial overreaching is not just about um, getting rid of the enumerated powers. Let's talk about Dred Scott. Dred Scott um, is uh, one of the worst examples of judicial overreaching, and it is of a piece with the judicial activism of the Warren Court and later generations. And I know progressives don't like to hear that. They don't like to think that they're living in the tradition of Dred Scott. But if anyone listening isn't familiar with Dred Scott, I'll just uh, sort of remind everyone that Dred Scott was the case in which Chief Justice Taney held that 
the Constitution's privileges and immunities, and indeed none of the provisions of the Constitution could apply to African Americans, that it was exclusive, that the rights of citizens could only apply to white citizens. Um, a, a limitation that exists nowhere in the text, that you could only derive by, by inserting your own preferences into the text. Um, so that is another example. Certainly the Warren Court's jurisprudence um, had the same philosophy. They went in a different direction, but the idea of Griswold versus Connecticut of a fundamental right to privacy and contraception um, is an addition to the text. And one final thing, Brian, the other way in which the judiciary has overreached, which doesn't get as much attention, is by the abuse of what they call equitable powers. So in 1971, after the court started issuing all these busing edicts and segregation, uh, desegregation uh, edicts, the issue came up to the Supreme Court. How do courts have this power? And uh, Chief Justice Berger said, well, it's inherent in the court's equitable powers. Um, and so since that time, that case was Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg School District. And I think that is one of the lesser known examples of judicial overreach, because since that time, the federal judiciary has gone on to run schools, hospitals, housing authorities, prisons, um, a, a power that was never imagined by the Founding Fathers. That was a nice primer on Dred Scott, Adam, and uh, it's, it's uh, concise in the way uh, that you, you manage throughout your book in describing these very complex legal cases. You've clearly mastered your, your constitutional history. Um, but let me shift gears a little bit and ask a more philosophical question. Originalism, and you consider yourself an originalist in judicial philosophy, is viewed as, as a, a constitutional theory that seeks to discern the original intentions of the Founding Fathers. That's not quite right as a description of originalism in your view, is it? That's right, Brian. And originalism got off to a slightly wobbly start because uh, then Attorney General Edwin Meese referred to a jurisprudence of original intention. And so the criticism became, well, you, you don't know what the Founding Fathers intended. And I agree with that. We can't know what was going through James Madison's mind. So what originalists have since clarified, and, and I think almost all originalists take a broadly similar view, which is that we advocate um, that judges apply the original meaning of the text, and that is the original public meaning, what the words of the Constitution meant to the public that ratified it. So that would mean the words as they were understood uh, in 1789 for the main text of the Constitution, and then at each date when the subsequent amendments were, were ratified. And that is, why, that is why I wrote the Naked Constitution. Uh, otherwise, I could simply pass out free copies of pocket Constitution. But the challenge is that language changes. The words of 1789 don't necessarily um, mean the same thing to us today. So it takes some historical research to understand what the public thought they were getting into when they agreed to give the federal government power to regulate commerce. That's what the book is about. It's really a guide to the historical meaning of those phrases. Your book concludes with a broad proposal for a new constitutional convention. How would that address some of the problems that you've described in your book, and what would keep such a convention from being hijacked by people with bad ideas? Well, to answer the second part first, there's nothing necessarily that prevents a, a, an amending convention from reporting out bad proposals. That's a risk you take. But I would argue that that is, at worst, a waste of time, because nothing that a convention proposes would become part of the Constitution unless ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures. That's three-fourths of both houses of the state legislatures. And nothing will get past that, um, uh, that hurdle unless it is broadly supported by red and blue states alike. Um, things like a balanced budget amendment might have a chance. Um, now let me talk a little bit, sort of step back. What is this amending convention? The Constitution in Article 5 gives us two ways to amend the Constitution. One is to start with Congress. Uh, Congress passes by two-thirds vote am uh, amendments, they get ratified by the states. That's the way it's been done with all 27 amendments to date. The problem we face today is that the biggest challenges in constitutional law, I would argue, are uh, structural problems with the federal government and Congress in particular having too much power. And Congress is unlikely to agree to amendments that restrict its own power. 
the founders envisioned that. They gave us another uh, method. If two-thirds of the states agree, Congress is required to convene a convention that will consider amendments to the Constitution. It's a tall order, but we've come very close. We came two, sto two states uh, shy of a constitutional amending convention in the 1980s over the issue of a balanced budget. And those remaining states were, were unfortunately bought off with the graham rudman hollings legislation, which was later partially overturned and never did anything to um, ensure a balanced budget. Thanks, Adam, very much for coming by. Thanks, Brian. It's been a pleasure. The book is The Naked Constitution. It's just out from Broadside Books. And the author is Adam Friedman. I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal. And I wanted to thank you all for watching.